Hey everybody, welcome to yet another episode of Back to the Light. I am your host, J.D. Rieger. With me is Steve Mayer, the proprietor of the Mary Crest Sessions, I guess, the uh, the founder, the producer. I'm always averse to uh, giving myself any sort of title, so yeah, we'll go ahead and go with that. Something <laughs> works perfectly fine. One of those things. Uh, Steve, thank you for joining me on the show. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me. Well, I want to, you know, I don't know you that well, so I've got some getting to know you type stuff to get through first, if you don't mind. By uh, all means. First first things first, uh, I think you're not from Memphis, are you? No, I'm uh, actually a Chicago native, specifically uh, the suburbs of Palatine. I moved down here, it's been nearly 10 years at this point, I had uh, moved down here to study uh, the recording industry and, uh, you know, m- the music industry down at uh, University of Memphis. It's been uh it's been a wild ride since then, you know. I've uh hopped through uh Arden Studios, you know, worked down at uh you know the former site of Black Lodge back when it was just known as its address, eight thirty one South Cooper, now uh known as uh the Zen House. I still give run sound, you know, throughout the high tone, Young Avenue Deli and you know, various festivals and other stuff like that. It was one of those things that uh, you know, I had initially moved down here to yeah, just study and I while I'd initially intended on going back, having caught on with a lot of the studios and venues around the city it was one of those moments where i kind of just assessed my options man it's warmer it's normal it's cheaper and uh like things have already gotten started down here and next thing i knew you know a whole decade had passed i can definitely feel you on it being cheaper you know i just spent like five years in chicago oh man not too long ago and uh yeah it's uh it's it's more affordable to live here for sure oh dang straight it's just one of those things that uh and it's a completely different culture too it is yeah yeah and, you know, it's always much love to that city. I still, you know, go back and visit once a month, you know, perform with my friends down uh, down in our uh, general local area, just, you know, have fun, jam. and You go back that much? Um, When I can, you know. Like, I still, uh, yeah, still sing with a band and called uh, Liquid Faction, which is me. I'm mostly just a uh, cover act right now, though they've got some originals c- dropping at some point or another. Something that, you know, music has been, you know, in my system for you know a very good amount of time at this point and yeah some some connections you know never never uh quite dissipate that easily well how did you get into it in the first place did you come from a musical family or how did you discover you know this is actually real music <laughs> this is actually a real wild one i wonder how much uh it's a good thing i don't believe too much in like crud and stuff like that i used to uh i wasn't that m- much of a musical family i was part of i Back, you know, during elementary school and, you know, those older days, I used to, uh, yeah, I, you know, I did classical piano, you know, as much as my uh, lessons dictate and all that. But I was never, you know, particularly into that, so I kind of, you know, fell out, out with it a bit after a while. Though slowly, you know, I kind of, you know, kept, I was always fascinated, you know, by, like, you know, video game themes at first. And then eventually, you know, I, st- right as, uh, you know, Guitar Hero and the Rock Band uh, games were dropping, me and uh, my friends used to uh, drop into that a lot and... It eventually culminated in starting a band with, you know, the childhood friend of mine that's kind of got me back into, you know, learning how to, yeah, learning how to play keys again, learning how to uh, play bass, you know, just solely off YouTube videos and starting to sing again. And it was also how I uh, started, you know, getting uh, in- inclimated with a lot of other, both rock music and other types when slowly but surely, you know, I wanted to just, you know, get more involved with the industry of that type. Like, I wasn't, yeah, I was initially a hardcore gamer, but, like, I always was interested in design and stuff like that, but it just didn't work out. It was, uh, computer science was a little too uh, far advanced for me, so, but... Too much math? Oh, yes. That's, <laughs> One I... of those things, like, uh, you know, there, me and some friends used to take uh, video game mods and, like, that, you know, like, did, like, 90% of the actual coding work for you. All you had to do was just enter the, uh, in, in, import whatever data you were going into, so... The second you started, yeah, I tried starting from scratch. It was, uh, yeah, it was a wild scenario that <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> just even imagine. Didn't quite happen. Well, so at what point did you start to take music seriously as a career? What what made you think I want to actually do this? It uh, it initially started as uh, when I once I moved down here and started studying. Like initially, I had uh, gotten into it for purely. Uh, Reasons that, yeah, quite frankly, were purely selfish. You know, I just wanted to learn this so I could, uh, you know, get my degree, get uh, <laughs> my family off my back, and continue onward. But as I slow, yeah, as I slowly just got acclimated with, you know, just working shows, you know, helping, uh, helping people, you know, get their get their own music out. It's uh, there was a feeling that just, you know, kind of uh, never went away after that. 
it was something that I truly enjoyed. I think mostly because, you know, back when I was in a band, I it was very difficult. You know, we would write we would write stuff, and you know, we, it would take some effort to put it out. Like, you know, we didn't have no. We were just in junior high and high school. We couldn't really. We didn't know how to take quality videos. We did, certainly didn't have the material to release quality recordings, and uh, a lot of those memories kind of wound up uh, cast by the wayside. And it's something that I still, in many ways, regret to this day. We tried to. Uh, we have recordings and stuff like that that aren't, you know, of the highest quality, but it's hard to uh, make memories like it was hard to make memories like that and uh, maintain them for both for posterity's sake, just for just for yourself as well as for anyone else who wanted to hear them. And I think in many ways that's kind of like uh, what I like the most about you know doing streaming like this. Like even when I was working uh, a thirty one, where I was not just you know engineering, I I was you know managing, I was booking, I was doing all sorts of other stuff like that. It's the one thing I had the most fun doing were uh, these broadcasts because you want when people just get started out and they want to you know share that music, it's all it's difficult to share it in a high high enough quality capacity especially when you're just getting started and you don't don't necessarily know or you don't necessarily you, want to commit the the You don't the want to finances. make a record necessarily. Yeah, you don't want to com- you don't have you don't have or you don't want to commit the finances necessary to put that out just immediately but you still want something more than just what's recorded off of you know your standard uh, cell phone cell phone audio to show around and uh, share with people it's something that kind of really just got contagious from there what drew you to like, cause you've, you've talked, you work a lot in live engineering and you do live streaming shows, right? but you, you said you bounced around in some studios before yes. that. Why do you think you're drawn to like the more live engineering as opposed to the more detailed and, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, album projects can, can last forever. I mean, is that, is that, <laughs> is that it? I think it's uh both that and also a form of. With live when you're when you're running live sound, the biggest difference that I've noticed is that you are on a very strict and very uh, finite sense of uh, time. You don't have you don't have you know the luxury of being able to agonize or making sure everything is absolutely perfect. Everything is every note, every it's not hit, really even expected. Yeah. No, it's more, more just like I want this to be able to go out on you know in a timely fashion and have it you know have people who are listening who may or may not have already heard it enjoy it. And I think that's uh, yeah, just kind of it prevents you from getting a little into a bit of a man. What kind of word are you looking for? Like writer's blockish type of situation where yeah. You're just agonizing. You're like tweaking on little things that, like, slowly but surely become more less and less noticeable to anyone but yourself. And at all of a sudden, you know, so much time has passed. You almost wonder, like, wait a minute, why am I? What, what, what's the holdup? Yeah, yeah, I, I have been there. Um, when you're doing live, are you still with the high tone? Yes. What do you, do you like? What's it like working for Skinny? Oh, it's 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 always fun stuff. Or oh yeah, like I uh, when I had started uh, getting into live recording, like I I was initially you know down to U of M, you know just uh, I was fortunate enough to have gotten into uh, Arden Studios to, as uh, an intern slash day night guy to kind of you know knock the uh, studio stuff or yeah the studio portion of you know my career around and. Because of like you know the yeah those uh those moments that I had uh, mentioned earlier about like things getting a little too uh easy to agonize over, I slowly started to uh kind of implement yeah just like a time limit on like you know putting mixes out because I I just wanted to get my reps in you know just continue to uh, learn and you know just build up my uh, knowledge over of what was going on here. So, uh, like, I used to, living off campus, you know, Skinny would used to be down at Newbies, where uh, uh, Craft and Barnes, well, you know, I worked with 831, and Sounds Good and Beyond were, and I spent most of my, you know, early time, you know, in live sound, just kind of, uh, yes, just uh, watching alongside Craft and seeing, you know, how we kind of approached this, and eventually, you know, coming up with my own methods of, you know, yeah, attacking uh, live sound gigs 
And, you know, like, I've always had major respect for Skinny. You know, he is the type of, you know, backs all genres, backs all demographics, always carries, you know, in respect of making sure, you know, live music comes out, you know, as frequently as possible rather than, you know, just... Rather than just trying to, you know, make uh, special occasions, you know, and highly paid... Oh, yeah, there's music... I tell. There's music the at the high tone through. almost every night, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And those are, like, you know, the venues that I always wound up frequenting the most, because that's where you usually are able to find those who are just getting started and those who are still looking to sh- look- looking to share their music without... Uh, but not necessarily having the means or uh, desire to do it this early. Being a live uh, sound engineer... Not always the most glamorous. Not but. always. It's <laughs> do you do you happen to ha- do you have any? I don't know if, if nightmare is the right word, but any stories? Uh, you know, equipment malfunctions, diva musicians, any any crazy live sound stories? Live sound is always tricky because, like, in many ways, like I always liken it to. Um, it's like being, you know, a referee or an ump- umpire on, like, you know, a sporting event. Like, you're expected, you know, be on the top of your game, and the best compliment to your performance is that nobody even noticed you were there. Luckily, I, uh, yeah, because I'm, you know, I always try to gravitate towards, you know, the more DIY type and uh, lower level events. I don't have that many uh, nightmare moments, but there have been, you know, times where, yeah, like, you know, sometimes the equipment now functions, like, it w- there was this one time we were running a, uh, a Women in Memphis Music was actually running a, uh, a large festival type event down in the upstairs room. We were there, we podcasted there. Yes, indeed, and uh, that day, we actually had two of the monitors, uh, the hearback monitors, uh, the center one and the drum wedge, actually had uh, gone out in the middle of uh, Mama Honey's gig, and as I was jumping around from uh, spot to spot, like, in between, I uh, just, okay, something is clearly not, something is clearly not projecting through into this room right now, I gotta, look what's going on, I just start testing the house music through each of these wedges, and, like, the second one's on, like, okay, fine, 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 we're good, there's, yeah, we we still have three, it's three, that'll, that's still enough power, then I tested the fourth one, like, oh, oh, god, no, this can't. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but especially considering we had like uh, Hope Claiborne's eight piece coming up, the oh, good yeah. news is, is like, like, and that's the key with live sound. You need to be able to. You can't. You don't have time to. You know, just open up. You know, whichever piece of equipment is, and like actually legitimately troubleshoot it. If you if you something goes out, it's literally in many senses just it the just next eliminate. next thing up, or just imp- it's improvisation. Yeah, and. Luckily, being, uh, you know, having been on the scene for 10 years, like, I like to think I'm familiar with a lot of the people around, and everybody was really, uh, you know, open-minded about, you know, what, what the limitations were and what, what was going forward, and we could still still put on a quality event no matter what happened. Luckily, you know, just, yeah, going through that, there usually aren't a lot of, you know, DV musicians who come through, but, like, really the only problems you have to look for in situations like that are, you know... Some people like to uh, get mobile with their with their vocals, and I think one person once came up with a lapel mic, which is like, oh, <laughs> which is an yeah. omni which is an omnidirectional mic that will catch any every every noise that's coming around, which makes it a feedback nightmare, which is always always a battle. I think I had one once had uh, one uh, heavy act come in with like what amounted to an Xbox headset as their vocal. Oh my goodness! And it's like it was it, it was a wild scenario. There were. There are times, yeah, mostly when when, equi- when equipment functions, when stuff like that goes down. But I've heard, while a lot of this can't be attributed directly to me, like, I've heard a lot of horror stories, you know, down at, like, you know, larger events down at the New Daisy where there are... There are demand, yeah, there are uh, some national tour nights that get very demanding or with both uh, sound and lights and stuff like that, I recall. I think one, like, insisted, do not use any white lights throughout. And, like, yeah, one uh, hands, one one uh, little slip of the hands caused. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have... Moment s- of to stop uh, singing and berating, like... I've seen some stuff, too, man. They're, uh, I opened once for the, the Wailers, like the Bob Marley and the Wailers. Oh, man. And uh, the singer of the Wailers ripped his sound person a, between songs. Oh, God. A new asshole. And between That's every brutal. song, it was hilarious to watch him go out there and be like, you know, peace and love and, you know, legalize it and whatever. And then, you know, 
call this poor girl a, a worthless piece of oh, shit God. in between songs. People getting out. Like, some people get very two-faced with the L. No matter uh, the, the size or uh, the danger of the issue. It's, it's always one of those things that... Uh, you know, over the cross course of my career, like, you know, I still, you know, yeah, I still stay loyal to Skinny and the high tone. I still, you know, do other gigs around there. And I think some people ask me, like, why I don't, like, you know, go out, out for the shell or, like, you know, mingle wood, like, in its full capacity or anything like that. And it's mostly for reasons like that. Like, I, I prefer to work, you know, on a smaller scale because, like, back when I was, you know, trying to break in, you know, we didn't know anything. We were still trying to, you know, get along with that and... Well, we never, of course, everybody always thinks about, you know, hopefully one day getting big. You know, you always want to remember where you initially started. And, yeah, you know, I, I just don't want to be around with people who lose their lose perspective like that, I guess, in that sense. It's one of those things that, this is one of, this is one of the professions that, like, you know, I truly, you know, enjoy doing. Like, I know, I never consider this a job or anything like that. I enjoy it fully and you know i never want to be participating in anything that makes it a feel like a job or feel worse feel like worse than that yeah it, it'd be great if it was you know financially sustainable but it, it doesn't oh natural it, it's yeah no, it that's always the trade-off like work. yeah that's always the trade-off all right well let's dive into the mary crest sessions but first let's let's hear a sample from absolutely one of them. let's hear uh i think we're going to listen to and see uh season desist first what uh what song are we going to hear from them and what do you remember about that session this is a song called uh fuck your black pill i was a very uh yeah big fan of uh season desist and of course yeah their initial formerly the negro terror the original negro, members yeah, formerly known as negro terror and this this session was, I believe, our fourth one. This is when uh, the series was just uh, starting to get off the ground. This is before I had light implementations. I was still uh, figuring out the uh, the limitations of uh, the setup I had put together. If you actually like watch the video, there's a moment where uh, on uh, one of the cameras I had accidentally <laughs> left the uh, display. There, there's a display that has like you know the amount of time remaining like you know initial like you know controls and stuff like that there's an attention to detail that you always have to you know grasp at when it comes to streaming but overall like the sound quality at first you know even when we were just getting started like the, our first debut broadcast with, with the smoke and jays and the best uh view of what we got was the sound quality immediately and how it can handle both both lights tunes as well as heavier tunes like Season Desist was the first uh, legitimately heavy uh, band that I held on the on the broadcast, so it was a very uh, it was a very teachable moment as well as a very yeah just a very fun moment. You know, I've always been good friends with Rico and Wright, and uh, yeah, I was glad that they were able to well, able and willing to uh, jump on this so early in uh, in the early stages. Well, cool. Yeah, yeah, I love them. They were guests on the podcast. Ride's been on twice, actually. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's let's check out Season Desist on the Mary Crest sessions. Mm-hmm.
All right, I'm back with Steve Meyer, and we're going to talk about uh, Steve. <laughs> I got in my head about it. All right, we're back with Steve Mayer, and we're here to talk about the Mary Crest Sessions. Steve, what was your inspiration? Please leave that in. Second, <laughs> I get. We'll, we'll we'll discuss it. Of course, of course. Well, now we have to because you asked me to leave it in. So I, now, know, I know. So now we have to leave it in because we referenced it. Of course. Unless we cut the whole thing. Yeah. It's Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. Yeah. M- much like uh, John or Mercer Mayer, but like it's it's a, it's a very easy mispronunciation. It's very fun to we don't have know. Episode go so long. We don't often reference John Mayer on the show, so. Nor, yeah, nor would I, yeah, nor would I expect you to, but it's all. <laughs> all right. We. Well, well, you know, we'll leave it in truth, oh, truth in broadcasting. But uh, absolutely, tell me what inspired you to start the Mary Crest sessions. <laughs> so, the Mary Crest sessions was is in many ways continuation from the eight thirty one show. It's uh, what I used to do down at uh, the former site of Black Lodge. That eight thirty one show didn't uh, didn't we play that in Mystic Light Casino? Engineering. Yes, Here, Eric, did. he's nodding. So I guess that's a yes. Yes, yes, he did. Okay. It was Sorry. a show that I used to do, you know, with uh, Kraft and Barnes. Like, it was initially started when we were on a, um, when I had uh, first uh, linked back up with Kraft and after uh, Newbies had closed down, we had, had mentioned uh, that he was at Young Avenue Deli and that we were start, he was uh, starting to do uh, broadcasts off uh, what was called, known as Mississippi River Radio, and we eventually implemented, you know, some live guests that eventually culminated in, you know, doing live songs and live streaming and taking live video and things like that. It was a series that had gone on for about two ye- about two years and beyond eventually until we until we had both eventually yeah just departed, mostly uh, due to burnout. It was one of those moments where it was it was the favorite thing that I'd done on during at eight thirty one while we were even while we were running, you know, full full fledged shows, you know, ha- having you know events and everything like that, just because, as I had mentioned before, it was about it was about introducing people, especially those who had not uh, yet had material to share onto the scene, you know, giving them content to work with, to you know, share with other venues, share with their fans before they you know cut real actual records. And after after we left, like shortly after the pandemic had started, and I spent most of the pandemic just kicking myself over that. Like everybody was starting to, you know, attempt to live stream because you know there were no venues to host music, and I just sat there thinking to myself, "Oh my god, I have just I had everything at my disposal to be at the center, and you know." And help artists, you know, during during this time, and I had just walked away from all of that. And you know, while my friends and you know family insisted to me, listen, you were burned out, you had to get out of there. I, it still was something that haunted me. I was always like, well, yeah, but still, there was still there was stuff to be done. There was meat on the bone, still, yeah. There was, there was. And while I was, I was then living in an apartment down um, out in Midtown, and that of course was yeah certainly no position to do that. So I would jump around from house to house, you know, looking for a potential base of operations with which to do this, either that or a building of some type. And I had spent probably you know three or four months going through houses, mostly thinking, man, if okay, if I knock down this wall, if I do all this baffling, if I do all this cra- this crazy electric work, then maybe, just maybe, this will be viable as a spot to use. And go figure, on my 30th birthday, this house at, down on Mary Chris Drive had come up on the market. And as I was scrolling through the pictures, I noticed that there was some form of music room already in there. There were uh, diffusers, as well as, you know, a set of organs that were already there. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is an actual rehearsal space. This is, uh, this is like 90% there. And as after I walked through the house, I immediately, you know, just went around to write a letter to the previous owner saying, listen, I'm after this house. I'm putting in a pretty significant bid for this. I worry that, uh, you know, there might be, you know, a landlord or, you know, some a renter, you know, probably offered more than this. But here's what, here's, you know, what I'm going to do with this room. Here's, here's what I've done on the scene that, you know, reflects all of that. Wow. I feel confident that I am probably the only person bidding on this who is going to use this room the way have you, you have already been using it. 
And a few days later, my realtor contacts me back. He said, he said, listen, he's taking your offer. And also, if you want these organs, you can have them. I was like, and I was just stunned. Wow. It was a moment where the organs themselves, if you've uh, been in the house, yeah, you, you'll see them. They, d- they don't actually work right now. Yeah, two Hammonds, two Hammonds and a Leslie Cameron, they, they don't work and they're naturally a pain. But like, it was, it's not s- equipment that you just hand off to who I believe is a total stranger. I mean, that's nearly $10,000 worth of gear. Like, wow. I've always been a believer in that if you give to the, the community, it'll give back to you. And there was never a bigger validation than that moment. So over, you know, the next two years, you know, there were a lot of renovations being done, you know, just to a, to make the house livable and to set things up, getting, you know, the remainder of the baffling put up, getting the equipment acquired and tested. And it's uh, it's a series that has uh, started off in March uh, I mean, sorry, May of last year, and it uh, has not looked back since. So, uh, I mean, just to go back a second, you think the, ori- the original owner took a lower offer from you to you? I mean, is that I what would you not suspect? know. I would not know if that is true, but like this was right around the time that the housing market, you know, was you know going completely out of control. You know, what with yeah. what with COVID and everything else that was going down there. And while I, you know, I had put an offer that was you know higher than the initial you know asking price, like. Hmm. I had, uh, there were like some other spots that I had like, you know, tried to go in on that wound up like getting sold off or like, you know, was such a significant higher, significantly higher amount than they were, they were being listed for that I thought, oh God, I've got to, I can't let this one slip through my fingers. I got to do everything I can to try to make sure it lands in, uh, lands in my hands. And yeah, like, sounds like it was meant to be. I would certainly, yeah, I, cert- I would certainly imagine so. Like it was, it was of all the houses and buildings I had seen, the one that I felt was the easiest to adapt to an operation of this design. And so far, it is, yeah, it has done exactly that. You know, there was a closet that's, you know, eventually and currently been turned into an ISO booth. Like there, I'm slowly in the process right now of turning my what is currently my bedroom into a control slash mixing room of sorts. It's yeah, it's been a massive work in progress, but like the amount of uh, effort that's gone into it over the last two years and the quality of the output of what has come out, I think has eclipsed to any of any other spot I could have probably hoped for. How many episodes have you done or they're not, they're not really episodes, I guess. But how many guests have you had? Um, we're on thirty-four and counting right now, and we, yeah, we've got a whole bunch lined up. Like you know, every Tuesday throughout the first April one is already is currently held. There's a whole bunch of uh, bonus dates already held in wow. February and March. Like this thing is uh, trying to push forward. Who do you got lined up? Oh man, um, next week we've got Stay Fashionable on Tuesday, followed by Spite House on Friday. And yeah, there's a whole mess of artists, you know, of all types of genres. I don't know either of those top bands. My... I have to confess, <laughs> it's all good. In many ways, that in many ways, that's that's my intention. You know, there's a lot of uh, known. There are there are known acts, and also acts who are uh, just getting started that would have no releases. That yeah, I've wanted and, to. And uh... No, no member of either of those bands should take that personally because no, I, no. I mean, I'm almost I'm about to turn 45. I, I, I'm you know, they're probably younger bands. I would assume. And I, I don't get out as much as I used to. So, Absolutely. Um, I actually value this. Uh, what you're doing here is super cool for someone like me who, you know, quite frankly, needs to catch up on some of the Memphis bands that I'm not so aware of that are, you know, younger than me. So I'm I'm kind of down for what you're doing. here. Yeah. One of the things that I like to do the most about this is that while there are there are other there are other organizations and other uh, musicians who are capable of streaming, like if you're a solo songwriter, if you if you just have uh, tracks or, you know, keys or guitar to play along with, it's a lot easier to set up a stream. But for bands without, you know, you know, proper equipment, it's very difficult to get a quality sound out there. Not necessarily studio quality, but, you know, good enough that can be easily shared without, you know, yeah, more advanced equipment available. And a lot of series, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, respect. I would say that you're getting pretty, uh, I mean, I, I know from our session, I know from the Owlbear session I've watched and the Seize and Desist session that I've seen and that we just uh, heard some of. I mean, you're getting way better than demo quality audio I i'm glad say. i'm glad yeah. i I'm much appreciate that and there are, you know there are studios that also do this but i think yeah one they don't do it anywhere near as yeah, as often as you know weekly nor 
and often more than or often. Or as democratically. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of uh, certain you know areas you know only stick to certain genres and other types of uh, demographics that are e- more accessible. And I, one thing that we always wanted uh, you know make a point of what yeah, back from uh, the beginning of eight thirty one and what I've uh, continued to do with this is to make sure you know this this series is for everybody whether you are. Whether you have nothing out or everything out, whether you ha- whether you're light or whether you're heavy, whether you're electronic, no matter what it is that you're trying to uh, spread your message around, it's it's open doors. I dig. And like it, that man. was that's, the big thing that I always noble. respected the most about you know Skinny at the high tone, you know Mike and the others down at Growlers is that they don't just do you know your occasional like you know. Not necessarily a lister, but high level, you know, top tier types of artists that are, you know, already well known and already guaranteed draws. They'll do stuff, you know, no matter which day it is, no matter which genre it is. If you want to play, we will. They will help help you, you know, get your get your show set up and you know ready to go out. And that's where I you know, mostly frequent, you know, one because I work at the high tone, and also because yeah, since they're doing stuff, you know, daily, it's a lot easier to you know. Find artists who are, you know, just getting out there who can, you know, use that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with the small room especially, there's lots of up-and-coming artists down Absolutely. there. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, I want to be able to help people in the sense that, it, and give them the help that I wish that, you know, me and my, my old bandmates had back in the day. Because, yeah, we still had songs, you know, back, you know, in our high school and college days that, you know, never, never got printed, never got video recorded, never got audio, and, you know, they're simply... In many ways, lost to history, and you never want to uh, be able to be unable to look back on that. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, I have similar motivation for doing Back to the Light. Uh, you know, I, uh, I think that there's, you know, just not a lot of spotlight being shown on the scene, and I think that, um, you know, having these kind of conversations, I mean, in media, and uh, I, I. Uh, yeah, so I really admire what you're what you're trying to do with the Mary Crest sessions. Well, thank you very much, man. I mean, yeah, I've, it's been a, yeah, it's a pleasure to be on here, and I yeah, mad respect for what you do here as well, man. It was a pleasure having you guys on the show as well. Don't forget. Yeah, I almost <laughs> I almost asked you to bring something that we you know did to play on the show, but I was like, eh, you know, they've people on the <laughs> podcast have heard me enough. All good, all good. Um, you've got a Patreon, right? Yes, the Patreon is what yeah I started this year, and that's uh, what. I'm mostly looking to plug here as we go along. Naturally, I've run this show, you know, every week, every Tuesday that, you know, didn't have any, you know, last second conflicts or, you know, any major, you know, holiday issues or anything like that. And it was much like we did back when we were running 831, you know, every Thursday that we could. But, you know, there has been such an, you know, outpouring of support from the community. There's been such a long list of artists who wanted to get on. To the point where, like, you know, for example, this winter, like, the initial, a lot of the initial schedulings that he had gotten uh, discombobulated due to the winter storm, you know, people got sick, people got, had, uh, you know, travel issues, people had, you know, the work schedules, you know, adjusted as a result of the winter storm, but even so, like, even, you know, posting some last second, listen, this date is up for grabs, whoever wants it, you've got it, like, every single time without fail, it's been able to be filled. And there's the list of artists who, you know... Both want to work with me, and I want to work with them, and in all formats, want to be able to go down the list faster than just simply a weekly series would go. So, what this Patreon is is it offers, you know, all all fa- fans, musicians, anyone who just wants to support this, an easy way to do so. There's uh, four separate tiers. There's five dollars, fifty, two hundred, and five hundred. Five dollars is the, the standard for everybody it's sadly the nature of this the service you know live streaming you know recording video video streaming and sharing you know doesn't really lend to much of an offer but it does enable you to access my full calendar so it makes it easier for you or anyone you want to assist set dates while the late the latter tiers the more expensive ones are what I'm hoping will be you know more major collaborations among some of the other organizations in the city. For example, like the $50 one, you know, Garrett will guarantee you one uh, guaranteed broadcast each month 
for you as the artist or any other artist you prefer, while 200 and 500 will actually take this rig mobile for, you know, live album recording, live streaming of, you know, shows in any any location. I mean, that's the good news about that's this gear is that affordable for mobile recording. Absolutely. That's like, that's, I want to I want to offer it, you know, as a discount rate because, you know, yeah, the, the point of this is still a very it's still to make it accessible for those who are, you know, just just, you know, getting started and still want to uh, share these things. In, uh, I, I know what we paid someone to come out and record here not too long ago, and it was more than what you are charging. I would. Yeah, I would imagine so. <laughs> it's more than what you're asking limita- for support. The limitations, know, yeah. yeah, the limitations of uh, my gear, like, you know, kind of uh, restrict how high of the quality can go. But the quality still comes out very, very high quality, as uh, as you and uh, several of the artists would attest. We should. We but should, my end game if we, is if to, we ever do something here where we're trying to stream it again, we should talk to you. Absolutely. No, I'd certainly love no to. No offense like, to who we worked with last time, but. The point of these tiers is like, you know, whether it's, you know, local record labels or local venues who want to uh, do something, you know, semi-regular with, where these features are implemented. I'm yeah, willing to do that in order to make this feasible as a full-time operation where we can, you know, host shows not just on Tuesdays, but any day or any time that you know i'm available as and as that rolls i can only hope that you know it grows to uh that level of uh commitment you know my end game is to reach you know at some point yeah at least you know two grand of contributions a month and with if that is the case then all of a sudden you know my schedule opens up clearly and things uh might be able to expand you know even farther beyond that you know get additional camera angles get higher quality you know mics and recording and you know make it easier to yeah for the mobile th- mobile operation to travel along. So, and I mean, there's lots of reasons. I mean, technology is always changing. Gear needs to be upgraded. Gear needs to be fixed. Gear, you know, your time is valuable just in and of itself. Yeah. So there's there's lots of reasons to give to the Patreon page. You want to tell people, is there an address for that? Like a Patreon? Yeah, patreon.com slash the Mary Crest Sessions. Yeah, there we every, go. Uh, Every social that we have on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and uh, YouTube has a uh, has that link available. Threads, how is Threads working for you? It exists. <laughs> I had to. Uh, <laughs> that sounds it's, about right. It's there to. Uh, oh lord! I have I have resisted it used, the it call used, to Threads. It used to so be on far. Twitter slash X up until you know the, that whole mess. I don't want to offset. Oh, off topic this too much no that, that's it's cool. there it's there mostly just to uh yeah i feel you there is an operation like yeah so Patreon... mostly, yeah, mostly folks on facebook instagram and youtube where the activity is the highest and most easily accessible yeah yeah and but if by chance you're only on threads you can also see it there if um and the show live streams on social media and then the archives exist on youtube that's the every way show will regularly stream that yeah regularly goes on tuesdays and then youtube which is reserved for the archives will always uh get updated with uh after two days usually at like eight o'clock in the morning two days after the initial broadcast and date i always you know take two days it's to post produce the show there's always like some tricks that go into this tricky things you have to get over when you're uh, live streaming for starters like when you set up a stream on facebook you can't until the stream is actually live and active, you can't actually share the link. So you always have to start it earlier than the show actually starts. So you, people have an opportunity to share it. And while that's happening, you know, we just leave, you know, just rotation of the camera angles. There is a just an elevator music theme that's like probably like five seconds long, just on, en- th- on an endless loop. I think I remember this drill from when we played. Absolutely. It's something that, you know, yeah, YouTube is uh, the YouTube archive is used to. Yeah, just chop that section off, and, you know, if there's any, like, you know, weird blips or uh, missed syncs in the audio, you know, compared to the video, we can uh, fix those. Like, I'm working on archiving the the video footage a little bit better in case, you know, the OBS uh, a- activity, you know, actually accidentally freezes the image that you, that you might lose some frames. There's still, yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky to sync up, but uh, slowly but surely, you know, we're looking for better workarounds around that. Well, I wound up, wound up, you know, kind of streaming this on Facebook mostly to, because it was easier, you know, to tag individual people. It was easier to tag band pages to make it easier to share. While YouTube, you know, it's 
it's a lot easier to archive, because, but it's not as easy to tag in it in the current moment. Sure, sure. Tell me about the second band that we're going to listen to and see in the podcast, uh, One Strange Bird. This next band is called One Strange Bird. Yeah, they're yeah they're an alternative rock act. Uh, who had initially gotten started at Rhodes College? I had, believe I had caught them. I think on their fourth show down at the High Tone Small Room. And this is one of the one of the acts that you know gives me the motivation to do what, what I'm doing. This is an act that you know when once I initially approached them, they had you know they didn't have any merch merch ready yet. They didn't have any you know demos or EPs or anything like that out yet. But they had a whole yeah a whole crowd of people who were already enjoying their music. You know my my buddy uh, Dara who was working door because I was I didn't I wasn't able to catch the entirety of the set because I was working upstairs the high tone at the time and said dude these guys are dude these guys are fantastic man you guys you need to Get them on the show. Yeah, get them on the show, and needless to say, that was what we did next. Do you have any it's set up to arrange? And do you have any memories of the session in particular? Um, this session, which you'll be able to find, is also available on the YouTube archives. Is was this one came more when the show was now like you know four or five months into its uh, infancy. Like at this point, we had uh, I had managed to acquire some uh, lights to use in the room. Major uh, thanks to uh, Dale Naren of Owl Bear for uh, donating these to me, and this was when you Shout know things out. were a lot easier to. I had gotten a much bigger, bigger, better picture of you know how uh, this gear was functioning and how to utilize it, as well as I could as a one one person operation. And so so you think this mo- one shows significant progress from season to assist to to like you know in many ways yeah, yeah. But in terms of production value absolutely. All right, I get you. Well, yeah. let, let's check it out. This is One Strange Bird.
to pick out seeds and stay. And is it this where we began? Forging signatures, making friends. I really love you, I swear. Fears are gone now. All right, that's the show. Thank you to Engineer Eric behind the gear. Thank you to Shangri-La Records for having us here upstairs to do this. Steve, plug your Patreon and your YouTube, please. Once again, patreon.com slash the Merry Crest Sessions, youtube.com slash the Merry Crest Sessions, as I believe. Merry Crest is spelled M-E-R-R-Y-C-R-E-S-T. All I can say is you know, to the rest of you all is those who are already supporting, thanks as always for supporting local music. This is why... I do what I do. This music scene is so vast and still so full of talent from top to bottom with every genre, with everything that goes on across the city. There's so much to find and so much to see and so much to enjoy. And there's so many people who have, you know, helped make this possible. You know, shout out to Crafton Barnes and Allison Casper, you know, who, you know, worked with me on the early stages back when I was starting to live stream. Thanks to Dan War and Ward who, you know, helped uh, put this room together. Thanks to my family for being supportive. Thanks to all my friends, and thanks to all of the you know the musical acts who have already participated and who are already actively trying to participate. I can't wait to uh, continue to go down this path and uh, to continue to aid the local music scene is yeah, the best I can. Well, it's a way that I'll you know archive. You know there will be so much there will be so much to see, so much to share, and so much history you know owed to track. And I think. If anything, you know, that's what the scene's all, <laughs> this operation's all about. Much like yours, I'd imagine, no? Uh, uh, yeah. For music and other fine podcasts, visit backtothelight.net. Until Damn next straight. time, take care, y'all. <laughs>